In my internet browsing the other day, I did come across an interesting clip, and as it played, it, it definitely had an effect on me. We're going to watch it real quick, and uh, I have some comments, but for now, let's go ahead and roll it. And mm -hmm. Someone can walk up in to, to your two-year-old kid completely bare naked, and that's not a crime? even if it's on your property. Correct, well, so it's trespassing, but what I'm saying is there's no laws against the, the actual nudity portion of it. So, so you can expose yourself to children in Oregon. Again, if, if you're not doing it for sexual gratification, or the gratification of somebody else, yes, you are allowed to walk around in public naked. On private property, this is where I live, and someone just came and exposed themselves to my two-year-old boy, and right. this officer's saying that it's not a crime. So a naked person came up onto my property here, approached my two-year-old kid, completely naked, which I ran over to him and covered his eyes so he wouldn't see. My obvious thought is to call 911 as someone's indecently exposing themselves to my child on my property. At what point did this become a normal and acceptable thing to do? The cops will literally do nothing about it. They're basically saying we have to wait for that person to do something more serious to your kid before we can intervene. You're saying so, in the state of Oregon, some would say, some would say that this gentleman had the right to do so. In Oregon, you are allowed to walk around nude. Some would say, those with a sane, rational mind, uh, anyway, that what happened was lewd, obscene, and damaging to that child's psyche. So here comes a question. What is a right? What grants you a right? Is there a place where we derive the value that rights are given to us are there consequences or is there an ability to remove a right when you fail to fulfill the responsibilities that come with said right let's explore that as we watch our culture stray further every day howdy jonathan fiala for further every day here and uh i'm joined by a full panel to my far right i got miss nikki at the chair of theology how's it going good how are you today doing all right glad to have you there I'm glad to be here. So to her left, we got Melissa. How's it going? It's going good. How's it going with you? Doing well. And awesome. glad to have you there dealing with the rigor that the Christian must bring to the faith. To her left, we got the Charlie. How's it going, sir? Going wonderful. Thank you very much. Glad to have you there in the chair of culture dealing with the culture that is here and the counterculture the Christian must bring. To his left, we got in the chair of politics, the Steve. How's it going? Hey, man. Going good. Um, good to be back from our break. Man, I was really getting bored not having much time. <laughs> I know, right? You know, and missing both of those Charlies over there. And so, bo bo both of those Charlies? Are you seeing yeah. double again? Are those beer goggles or glasses? <laughs> oh. Okay, so, and then of course, here's truly sitting in the chair of economics. Rye Rye, the well, producer guy, sure. is on a hiatus. Uh, he's actually with some family for a long period of time. I'm Can you glad. believe that? We're glad that he's Man, he just up and left us. Yeah. He, he we missed you. Him. Come back. Yep. <laughs> Ryan. Ryan. So uh, we're glad uh, that he will be back at some point. We're not sure how long. But that's so, a good step out for Ryan. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it is. So let's talk about it for a moment. What exactly is a right? What forms it? And uh, to better understand this, I actually want to move to Mr. Charlie, and I want to get you to define a right. Do you have that pulled up? In front yeah. Of so Webster's 1828, the only dictionary that you really should be using. And we could get into a long diatribe on that. But it's a just claim, a legal title, ownership, the legal power of exclusive possession and enjoyment. Nice. In hereditary monarchies, a right to the throne vests in the heir on the decease of the king. A deed vests the right of possession in the purchaser of land. Right and possession are very different things. We often have occasion to demand and sue for rights not in possession. Uh, definition number six, just claim by courtesy, customs, or the principles of civility and decorum. Every man has a right to civil treatment. The magistrate has a right to respect. And then uh, definition number seven, just claim by sovereignty, prerogative, God, as the author of all things, has a right to govern and dispo uh, dispose of them at his pleasure so there's a lot to break down there and i do kind of want to open it up to the panel here because you know right is also mean morally right it also means it's correct it means to the to, to this side of the body 
but it also means that that there is a deeded or responsible there's a a privilege that is deeded to you by right you have something that is it is it is guaranteed to you because of your position and an authority above you has granted it do, does anyone have anything to add or disagree with on that i think i'm good with that it it, it makes sense right yeah. yeah okay so as long as that makes sense what i want to do is i actually want to pull up this is from uh learn liberty on youtube and i actually want to pull up their definition these guys are some folks who are uh more libertarian in uh their their how, how would you say it in their persuasion more, more libertarian they're more libertarian in their persuasion so uh what that means is we can we can definitely get uh an interesting view of a right from a secular perspective and so i'd like us to go ahead and just see how that goes here and we'll listen and pause tell me to pause if you want if you want to interject anything most generally, rights are moral concepts that establish the conditions within which we interact. When we say, you can't do that, we might mean that it's literally impossible to do it, but we might also mean simply that to do it would be wrong. When we invoke rights, we're insisting on a certain kind of interaction, not because another kind isn't possible, but because another kind would be wrong. That's why we can speak of violating someone's rights. You can't make a round square means it can't be done. You can't kill Fred means it would be wrong to do it. But do we have natural rights? By nature, we have spleens. If you cut me open, you'd find my spleen. But you wouldn't find any of my rights. So let's see if we can figure out what natural rights might be. If you watch any TV at all, you probably know that you have the right to remain silent and to have an attorney present during questioning. But not if you live in North Korea. The famous right to remain silent is a legal right. It's a feature of the legal system we happen to have. People in other countries may or may not have the right to an attorney. Similarly, if you're 18, you have the right to vote, but not if you were 18 in the 1960s. In 1971, the Constitution was amended to extend voting rights to 18-year-olds who had previously not enjoyed that right. A few years later, 18-year-olds lost the right to drink beer. These are examples of legal rights or constitutional rights. We have whatever legal rights the lawmakers say we have, and they can change at any time. But the Declaration of Independence refers to inalienable rights. Those aren't the sort of things that could change. Are there any such things? Because we get legal rights from the lawmakers, people sometimes make the mistake of saying that rights come from the government. But when the American colonists declared independence from Britain, they got rid of their government. Did that mean that they no longer had rights? Nope, that's the whole point. They thought that they had rights that didn't come from the government. Although constitutional rights are products of constitutions, the rebellious colonists thought that the right to live and be free was a right that we had by nature, and the point of even having a government at all was to protect those rights. Protecting rights we already have. This is the essence of classical liberalism and the revolutions it inspired. In the old days, people claimed that kings ruled by divine authority, so the king's rule was natural. Rights were permissions from the king, an artificial construct. To the classical liberal way of thinking, the right to live and be free is natural, and governments are artificial, institutions created to help protect or enforce those rights. So it turns the old model completely around, literally a revolution. But why should we think there's a natural right to live and be free? One way to think about it is this. Is it your natural condition to exist only as a means of sustenance to another organism? Or do you have an independent existence? We're all homo sapiens. The old model had us thinking that the so-called nobility were literally a better breed of person naturally suited to rule over the so-called commoners whose inferior dispositions made them suitable only to serve. I'm pretty sure that's not true. What do you think? So, if the right to live and be free is natural, then governments are doing well when they protect your rights and doing wrong when they violate your rights. Okay, so any thoughts now? Yeah. I know I know your thinking. I can hear you thinking right now. Go ahead. <laughs> 
I was going to wait for you to do it. Okay. So, <laughs> but, so here, here, here's, here's my big, and we're, we're going to keep watching this, but I, I, I do want to interject here. We're looking at this from the framework of the social contract with this gentleman right here. And he's talking about, you have the right to exist because you have the right to reason and you have the right to re, uh, uh, exist with, with rights. You have the right to live. You have the right for uh, an obstruction to your, your, your means of travel, your way of living, all those other things. You have that because you have the right to reason. The problem with that is what happens to those who are inferior in their reasoning? What happens to those who are inferior in their reasoning ability? Mm -hmm. What happens to those who are not developed yet enough in utero? What happens to those who are convalescing in a uh, hospice at the ripe old age of 95? Do they have the same rights as a 33-year-old who is on the government welfare system? Because he's treading a very slippery slope. I think uh, I, uh, that was not what I was going to say, but that's really well put. What I was going to say is that he has done a masterful job of bringing out the apologetic argument, the need for an apologetic argument regarding what exactly is a right where does it come from because if you do not define that you are in for a fight well hello welcome to the 21st century yep and and where are we what are we doing we are fighting over rights does the dad have a right to protect his child and not have somebody be obtrusive in 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 exposing themselves does the child have a right thank to you not be absolutely that's to right to not be exposed to that and so that comes down to obscenity laws when you look at constant well okay let, let, let's finish this and, yeah. then, and then let's jump now, in here's a question on on as... on that exactly do you have a right on your own property to not have your child exposed to that on your own property. Let's Wait. explore that in just a second. Yeah. Uh, let's finish this and then let's explore that. So, and doing wrong when they violate your rights. The government. As much as possible then, the legal system should create rights that are compatible with and don't contradict your natural rights. So that's where I want to I, I want to go ahead and split the baby here because I think that he and his and, and good well-meaning li libertarians, okay? Yes. I, I'm a recovering libertarian. <laughs> but what, what I mean by that is I, I no longer believe that that uh, libertarianism in and of itself is a good thing. It is not a good thing. You have to have a conservative Christianity because when you have a right that is bestowed by the government or when you have a, 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 and and you're in a huge peck of trouble because you've omitted God when you're a libertarian more so than you are a Christian you are not living in the power and authority of God. Mm -hmm. That's and called drinking the wine that's been turned from water to wine. You're going to have to elucidate you, that you later. Have you heard of the drinking the Kool-Aid? You're drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> ah, <laughs> okay. so, okay. so, hello. But, <laughs> But yeah, but you you got to set it up here, <laughs> Dave Chappelle. Okay, you got to set it up a little bit better. Well, I figured you knew what. But so 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 Charlie, and 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 then I actually want to get Miss Nikki too because I know that you guys were all thinking about it. But and and, and Steve, when you have a right, and Steve. Yeah, yeah. you yeah, and Steve, <laughs> when you have a right for uh uh. Let's let, let's let's just set this up correctly. Do you have a right to not see certain things? Do you have a right to not hear certain things? And so that that let's answer those questions in a minute. But let's actually set up the the whole premise of first off, what is a right? And I want to ask Miss Nikki this in just a moment. What where do we as Christians believe that rights come from? And it. it is, is there like a wellspring in, in a specific place that rights are derived from? Because there's some sort of value. If you were deeded certain rights by being a human, if certain rights are inalienable to you, that means that there's privilege. Wherever there's privilege, there's value. And that value came from something somewhere. Where do we as Christians really seem to think that that, that uh, wellspring derives? Well, 
we believe we have rights that were given to us by the Lord himself. And when you look in the biblical principles of the Old Testament, as a matter of fact, the founding fathers of this country laid down a lot of those biblical principles in the law. And we have lived in America under a lot of those guiding principles. For example, the right to own land, uh, the when the laws that were created, if you tried to steal somebody's land, steal their property, caused injury to their uh, an animal that they had, there were consequences for that. There are laws that in biblical times, um, the Old Testament, about uh, harming other people physically, harming them in business, defrauding them. So all of those things that you and I have lived our whole life, they're derived from the biblical principles that God laid down for the children of Israel. And those are the principles that as a conservative Christian that we are fighting for today because society, whether they believe it's from God or they don't, society functions under certain principles. And number one, it lands with the family first. But there are principles that promote society and principles that will collapse society. So, and I 100% agree and one of the things that, that really we've lost the narrative as Christians is that we know the author of our rights. Mm -hmm. And here's, here's, uh, I'm, I'm going to throw this out here and I, I want y'all to just, I want you to react to it first and then I want to open it up. But I, I'd make the argument that you can never lose a right. Amen. And what I mean by that is you don't lose the right to self-defense because you killed someone. You have a consequence in God's economy that you are put to death or you have to remunerate the value to the family by mm -hmm. paying them off for the rest of the, uh, it's an alimony check in God's economy in the Old Testament law. So you can't, I don't think that you can lose your rights. I don't think that that's biblical. You can have consequences. I, and I, there's a definitive difference. Well, and this goes right against our legal system because we've come out of common law and we've gone to case law. We've said, instead of saying God sets the precedent, yes. there's this overarching theonomous structure of morality. We're going to a heteronymous structure saying other other uh, uh, lawyers, uh, uh, judges, they've all decided it this way. Therefore, we are going to rule this way instead of going Black's, Blackstone out the window. And now it's all case law. Yeah. I don't necessarily agree with that respectfully. I know because you're, no, you you're, can agree <laughs> with it. you're a PhD candidate for so, law. So this is going to be a lot of fun. No, so, okay. So you gave the example of, of murder. So if God gives us the, the right to freedom, so let's say I kill, I kill you. Mm -hmm. My consequence for my action is I'm going to be imprisoned for the rest of my life. I lose that freedom that God had given God didn't, me. God, God did not in, institute prisons. The pagans did. And Jeremy, do you know who the origin, where do we get the modern prison system? Originally it was chattel slavery in uh, Sumeria and Egypt. And it was, and God never ordained prisons. Look it up in the Bible. Do you know who the father of the modern prison system is? It, it's a fellow named Jeremy Bentham. Okay, and Jeremy Bentham was actually a uh, utilitarian. He believed that if it was painful, it was immoral. And therefore, it, and if it was pleasurable, it was moral. The problem is with that worldview is the moment you have a dude uh, of ill repute and some lady in a dark alleyway in the middle of the night, and that, that guy decides to make some bad decisions for that woman's sake, you have a clash in that morality. That morality does not, it no longer holds. And so his idea was that you would lock prisoners up, not harm them, but you would allow them an opportunity to live out the rest of their lives away from society. This is a pagan humanistic idea. The idea of prison, God had three punishments. He had, and this is, is going to be fun, uh, Miss Lawyer, because <laughs> God had a paralegal, but you, you could run for the bar. You'd make a dynamite lawyer. Uh, God had three punishments. He had remuneration in the form of uh, uh, 
I'm 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 losing the word. You had you had to pay restitution right. yep. two to seven times, depending upon the crime and the severity and what the judges at the gates of the of the community decided. You had to pay two to seven times the value that was just damaged or destroyed. You had to pay an alimony for the loss of a loved one due to manslaughter. You had to uh, so for example, uh, you could be publicly beaten. So like in biblical law, you could, if you had a dude who was hitting his wife, you could actually get all the guys together in the city and they could actually say, you know what? Uh, I think how many times you hit this woman, we're going to hit you. That was actually an applicable law that was laid out. And then of course you also have the death penalty only to be applied with two or more witnesses that were not directly related to the crime or individuals thereof. Those were the those were the three options: death penalty, remuneration via uh, restitution, excuse me, uh, and 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 public caning or public whipping. Those were your only options. There was no prison. Prison is is a godless, pagan, heathen design. As long as we have it, I think that we should enforce the laws to the fullest extent. But it actually is an anti-biblical concept. So I do have a question in this, uh, and I'm sure you have an answer. What, what's the debtor's prison? Because the Bible does talk about a debtor's prison. Yes, debtor's prison was a Roman, Greco-Roman uh, 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 situation that came out of that. So you got to remember, Israel was conquered uh, in 200-something BC after they came in from, you know, Cyrus of Persia allowed them to come to uh, uh, Israel. Actually, he paid. He paid for them to come back and rebuild their walls. They built up a city and then around 200 something, 300 something BC, the Greeks came in and they besieged them and they took them over. And then the Maccabees revolted, threw off the Greeks. The Greek empire was kind of failing at the moment. And then the Romans overtook them and then promptly came back and curb stomped the Jews. And the, I think it's the, er, it, it's the uh, early 200s, so closer to Christ than further from in the 200s, the Romans came and stemmed that out. So you had the debtor's prison, which was a common practice among the Gentiles. God never ordained in the law debtor's prison. It's interesting, too, when you think about Cain. What did God do with Cain? And it wasn't just him. It was a few right after that. You could s clearly see they were they were uh, pushed out, not confined, but they were put in a place where they were not going to be around people. No, that was actually a decision by Cain. Cain, Ooh. Cain, Cain walked. Cain, God says, look. You're going to end up walking the earth because, and he says, you know, I'm scared. If anyone sees me, they'll kill me. And he runs away. That's true. And he builds himself a city. So that was actually, that was, a, again, a thing of man. Separation is not a thing of God. Prison. Mm, no, separation is. Old no. Testament. No. When we're, we're looking at the tabernacle. It's a, decision, it's a decision that you make as an individual. God is holy, but I'm saying the separation as, as a punishment. Okay. That is not a thing of God. That is a thing that man eventually will decide for himself as far as heaven or hell. But, and that, that's a whole nother conversation. Right, right. But prisons, right. but prisons were never ordained in biblical law. Yeah. And you look at, uh, is it China that does the caning? Uh, Singapore. 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 And they have really, really clean streets. I'm just saying, if you're spitting on the sidewalk, they will cane you. And so you guess, guess, guess what you don't do in Singapore? You don't spit on the streets. You don't litter. You don't chew gum. You don't. Yeah. So you know, I, I, if you want to have safe streets, uh, deterrence is only set up by violence, by the way. And so I, I, I think that's an important thing. But I, I would argue that you cannot, you do not lose your rights. You should receive a punishment. And if you continue to have those punishments, the, the, it will end in your life ending. But I think to Melissa's part, and, and I was going to bring this point up, you lose the rights but i'm sorry you don't lose rights but you don't lose rights from whom and i think that's the key point because i think to your point if we were talking about losing rights if you if you go to prison you lose the right to vote yep that's but where did that right come from that was something that was established by 
man, the forefathers man. by the Constitution. Yes. So that's my point. And that's why I think that that video. You have to delineate a little bit. There you go. What, what is an immutable right and what yes. is not. Yes. So if you have the right to self-defense, you have the right to self-defense. And this is where I think the, the criminal justice system has really lost its mind. And it's because you go to two things. A, you go away from a biblical form of punishment. Okay. And you come and you come into this idea of we can re rehabilitate people by giving them a soft, cushy jail sentence. That was literally Jeremy Bentham's idea. I know Arizona and some of these other guys are hard on hard on crime and they beat the crap out of their you know inmates. Uh, whatever. But the original idea was to keep them comfortable until they could be rehabilitated. But here's, here's the problem: is that but you look at it from like the, the biblical times population was a lot less everybody was a lot closer so if i did something to you people are gonna know now we have to look at the dna are we falsely imprisoning somebody so do we want to cane somebody or kill or do death penalty someone that two or more witnesses two, two or more witnesses but, dna evidence should never be used but for two death or more penalty. witnesses i'm like but Def are those are those witnesses biased to one party or another? Two or more witnesses who are not directly related to the crime. I get that from the story of Jezebel and Naboth. Okay, two or more witnesses that are not related to the crime. So, Melissa, your point is what? What are you trying to to nail down here? That pretty much that if I'm if I do wrong and I am sent to confinement, I'm going to lose my right. There's rights that I will lose that God has given me the right to freedom, the right to, you know, my inalienable rights. I, I lose that. But that's now, exactly that's my, point. my point. Is yeah. that is that yeah. So my point is this: is that a that's an unjust system. The prison system as currently set up, any system that's set up with some fundamental flaws in the philosophy, is highly prone to corruption. Yeah. And the modern industrial prison system in the U.S. The lefties got part of it right, but the rest of it they got totally wrong. There, the the in the prison complex in America should not stand as it is. It's a pri private public partnership. They pay; they're paid per bed. That is insane. And some of the some of the nutty, nutty, nutty things that happen with that, the, there is absolutely nutty stuff that happens in the prison system that should yep. not happen. But. I'm not saying that as long, as long as we have that system, I'm all for tough on crime measures, okay? As long as we have it and we don't have a different option, we have to exercise that. I'm a pragmatist in that, in that regard. But at its core, it's not a biblical system. And even the studies that the lefties are showing, lefties are pointing out now, look, you're taking away their rights, but you're not changing them. No matter if it's a two-year sentence or it's a 20-year sentence, you don't rehabilitate a pedophile. Oops, you know, as someone who's, who, who claps kids, you don't retain, uh, you don't fix them. So let's just lower the sentence, or let's just let them out. That's the response of the left. But that's our our that's... response is they shouldn't have been left alive. We have three <laughs> people who saw the kid coming out rubbing their. We we know what happened. That person should die. So I think Melissa, to I think you guys are actually talking a lot more closely than you might think. Yeah. What I'm saying is, is that the way he's wording it, that might be rubbing you the wrong way. The, the thing is, is that it's an issue of where do those rights come from? And mm. that's why that video is extremely compelling. I, I agree with you. That's a slippery slope that he's on. But the, the point is, is that it makes you think to the core of where do we get those rights? And what are those rights? That is a phenomenal question. And so can they be taken away? And again, I would say no, they can't. Your right to freedom and liberty, but there are consequences. Yeah, there have to be consequences. And so we we could split the hairs on that. But I would say that in my, in my opinion, and it's taken me a long time to get here. I've, I've listened to the arguments. I really do not think the current prison system, not only does it not work, it literally hardens criminals. And you go back and look at where it came from. It didn't come from God. It came from the pagan humanist side of things. And before that, it was a form of slavery. 
doesn't make sense. But we can agree on this, that you have certain inalienable rights that even as a prisoner, you are not able, you know, you, you can't take those away. There are certain rights you can't take away. Right? Maybe? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> I'll take it for now. Agree to disagree. I'll I don't well, know. I don't think I'm that, part of it. I don't think you have to see it the same way. I think that, you know, everybody, you know. Yeah, it's totally fine. That's what this is all about. So I want to move over to Melissa, even though we spent a good, good amount of time on the philosophy side of things. You're still on the mic. How, how do you write? <laughs> We're not canceling you. Yes. So this, the, I, and, and by the end of this, I think I'm going to, I'm going to slowly like bring you over to my side of the camp <laughs> because, because, <laughs> and I, and I'm, 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 I'm working, I'm all full Leonardo DiCaprio trying to inception this into your brain here, because I, I do think you're going to find some, some value here. How do rights in, in the ideas, how do rights differ when they are derived from God versus when they are derived from the state or from social contract mm -hmm. game theory, because you do have a definitive difference. And I think it's going to help kind of parse this. And I think it absolutely yeah. will. And this is where I might rub some people wrong here, but I'm okay with that. So you have, <laughs> so you have your God given rights and those are like the freedom of your freedom, your equality, your dignity. And these are the things that nobody can take away from you. And even scripture backs that up. Then you have, and this is where I'm probably going to rub the people wrong, is that you have the rights from the state, and I'm going to like do the rights from the state from the founding fathers' perspective, because I think those more align with scripture than what we have currently today. Because you do have the Declaration of Independence, where he, where Jefferson does mention the rights of happiness, of liberty, of justice. He mentions all those things, which are again biblically supported. Then you go into the Bill of Rights and no cruel and unusual punishment. Um, it was the right to a speedy trial, militia, freedom of religion, all those things that God supports as well. But then you have the social contract, which I'm saying is everything else. And this is where, and I hated philosophy in school, and yet here I'm, I'm sitting in this chair. <laughs> but um, so the definition of that social contract theory was the hypothetical agreement between one person or another. So if I did you dirty and the government didn't do anything to, to support that victim, then that person would have the right to rebel. And I think that's a, a line that you have to really tread very carefully on because John Locke is actually the... the I don't want to say the founding dot person of. He's the so, he's he he's the right wing of the Enlightenment, effectively. Right, but it's but what he's saying is actually in direct violation of Scripture. So you're you're referring to well, okay. So you're gonna have to break that down because you 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 were kind of in three or four places at once. Well, I think it you have to be in you know, honestly three or four places at once because you're talking about the laws and the rights of the, your natural rights. Mm -hmm. The laws and rights that the government gives you, which if you look at what the founding fathers intended our country to be established upon, Christian you know, values, you have those rights. And then now you have the social construct and the social contract of everything else where we have screwed it up. So the social contract, what, what, what I would say with that is, is here's where I do not subscribe to the social contract as a, it, it absolutely is in play, period. Social contract is in play. Do I think it's the source of morality, rights, or values? Absolutely not. And, and the reason why is this, it is not the source of the values because you innately have God's law written in your heart. The Bible says so. And we see that carried out. The social contract is a theory that you have this evolved sense of morality from I'm not going to hit Steve because Steve could hit me back. And now Melissa is elected as our, our empress de jour in this room. And she says, look, John Arthur, if you hit Steve so that Steve doesn't hit you back, I am now going to put you in timeout on the guest couch over there. Right. And you may not leave from the guest couch until, Okay, that's replacing biblical morality. But Steve might hit you back anyways. Steve might do that anyways. <laughs> that, 
that's replacing <laughs> biblical morality is the problem that I have with the social contract. It's trying to come up with and not you know Locke was a, was was incredibly incredibly intelligent, but not everything that men say is 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 accurate or right. Where I, where I don't subscribe to the social contract is this: it has no power. It might in it might be a good explanation for the godless, but those who are godly they have an obligation to carry out the biblical morality. I what do you agree. say to that? I would, I would agree. But then you have that conflict of the godless versus the godly, and then what happens? Yeah, and that's what we're seeing yeah. right now in our, in our world right now. We're seeing in our country right now today the play out. People would be mortified to live in a constitutional republic, like an actual – constitutional United States as was set by you had blasphemy laws you could not say GD in the streets and and get away with it they they were people were prosecuted for defaming the Bible and the word in in the um, I, I I have to pull it up I forget which decision it was it was in the late 1800s there was an individual who was um, posting uh, uh, sec sexual content in the newspaper or n n not even it was a mail order service he was prosecuted and stopped and the supreme court decided they said look this is deleterious to the environment this is deleterious to our children we can't have this in our system so people would be horrified at the quote-unquote rights or lack thereof of people in the founders america it was there were responsibilities that were given and you couldn't violate certain things you had rights but only underneath the structure of the godly morality things that were given to you and you could be prosecuted for violating morality and you had you had consequences right back i think the word you used responsibility is something we need to focus more on we focus on rights that's we it. don't focus on responsibility and responsible responsible for your society your culture your town uh your city that you live in for example the man that was walking around in that neighborhood naked the only thing the law well he had rights no he had responsibility to create a safe environment for a two-year-old child mm -hmm. that was part of his responsibility to live in that society he didn't, I didn't, i'm not saying he had to provide for the child but i'm saying his behavior is he's responsible for his behavior that creates a society that is safe and secure for all of us and and so that should i yeah. should i blow up the topic well, I want to I want to say one thing, and then I want you to do that after we, we, we deal with that. So our rights. So I, I want to pose this around. Hold that thought. Our rights directly derived from God. Correct. Yes. So if your rights, quote unquote, air quotes for the scare quotes for those who are on audio, if your quote unquote rights are in contradiction or being exercised in contradiction to God's moral law, is it really your right? And it's, the, I don't by think, definition, I'm, no. I'm gonna say, why does God give us the rights? This is where you have to go back to the foundation. Why? Why did he set up in the Old Testament what he set up? And it was to pr for a society and for families, society, culture to prosper. And so I'm going to make the argument just to finish the argument because that, 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 that's not at, you're right. You're correct. You don't have any rights that violate biblical morality. Correct. You don't. So a right is something that is within biblical morality, biblical law. And something and anything that is violative of that is actually not a right. Because remember, we talked about this. Your rights are derived from a from an authority, from a right giver, from the value that's derived from your being an image bearer. All right, Mr. Charlie, I want to make that point. Yeah, it's all yours. Go ahead, blow it up. I <laughs> man, I hope I don't blow this up. I just might. <laughs> so. Let's go back to Adam and Eve. 
Did they have the right to eat of the fruit? No. But they had the free will. And there's a different, so they had no right to eat of the fruit. How it, How is free will and right different? They are different. How? So free will is the reality that you can choose to do something right, wrong, within your rights, outside of your rights, violative of someone else's rights. Mm -hmm. So but your rights are your are the privileges that are bestowed upon you by the creation of you being an image bearer. But I had I have legal claim to make a choice. No, you didn't. You had legal you had legal no legal claim to make that choice. You had the right of choice, but not the legal claim to make that choice. You have the right you you have the right to make your own choices. You do not have the right to, to decide the legal consequences for those choices. That I agree with. That I agree with. Absolutely. Your choice I, of, your, your choice with, of conscience is your right. With rights there come large responsibilities. And with those responsibilities come consequences. And see, we're living in a society today. Everybody wants their rights, but they don't want any responsibility. So the man, the naked man, you want to go in your own privacy of your own home and walk around naked, that's your right. But your responsibility in society affects everybody else. But where does my right stumble upon your right? That's, that's just it. That's just yeah. it. Because I don't have... He did not have the right to subject the child to his nudity. He had a responsibility to society to behave in a manner that helps society prosper. <clears throat> and I'm... So I want to read... <laughs> I want to read something from the great did divorce. Did he have the right to come on to that man's private property and expose himself to his, to his own child. But what if this man was on the no, street yeah. where it's not private property, it's public property. And that's where, so, it, that's where decency laws come in. Yes. Well, and if he was on the street, then what, the cop would have been, at that point would have been able to arrest him because of the decency laws. No, no, no. In no. Portland, in Portland, you're allowed well, to Portland's do Portland's different. Yeah. yeah. On public property. Yeah. Cause it's not his own property. It would have been trespassing. And so because yeah. the guy was sitting on, the kid was on the grass and the guy's on the sidewalk. And because it's not quote unquote done for self pleasure, which it, I'm uh, sorry. It was, it was, done, for, it was, it was done for self pleasure. Yes, it you was. He was tell. absolutely, you're kidding me. You in the words of Andy tell. Griffith, you're kidding me. So uh, actually, th there is something that I do want to, and before I go to culture, and I want to get Charlie's opinion on this, but I think this quote from The Great Divorce is one of the singular best uh, notes of this conflation of rights. And I want to get your opinion on this. Okay, so just to understand, I, I got to set this up. C.S. Lewis's Great Divorce is the hypothetical. He makes up a, uh, a world where heaven and hell are traversable. People from hell come up on vacation to heaven just to see the edge of heaven. And there, every, every time this bus, this mythical bus from the depths of hell comes to heaven, they are able to step out onto the shores of heaven. And each and every individual effectively says no to heaven in their own way. And they get back on the bus, they go back to hell because they would rather have it their way than God's. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so this one gentleman is, is arguing with his coworker. Okay. And this coworker is a murderer murdered a, a mutual acquaintance of the two. And so you've got, and the coworkers in heaven and the righteous man is in hell. And they're meeting at this mythical boundary of the two, the two spaces. Uh, and so he's arguing with the, with the murderer who was saved by Christ, redeemed and went to heaven. So he says, so th this is the coworker who is as disgruntled and unhappy about God's choice to allow his coworker in heaven. I gone straight all my life. I don't say I was a religious man, but I don't say I had no faults far from it. 
but what have I, but I've done the best all my life. See, I've done my best by everyone. And that's sort of the chap that I was. I never asked for anything that wasn't mine by rights. If I wanted a drink, I paid for it. And if I took my wages, I done my job. See, that's the sort of, uh, that's the sort I was. And I don't care who knows about it. You may be, uh, you may think you can put me down because you're all dressed up in that. He's in his heavenly robes, which you weren't when you were working underneath me. And I'm a poor man, but I got my rights. Same as you see. And he goes on and he says, uh, oh no, it's not as all as bad as that. I haven't got my rights, nor should I here, says the other man. He says, you will not get yours either, but you will get something far better. Never fear. And the, the, the man coming from hell, the righteous man, not the murderer, says, what do you keep arguing for? I only want my rights. I am not asking for anyone else's bleeding charity. Mm. When you look at the struggle for rights, there's, there's a couple of things. There's the rights that man has assented and placed. And then there are the rights that God has given you. And this, and this is the tug, I think, between you have the right to vote, you have the right to uh, uh, an attorney, you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What is the difference? Well, one is created by man. And I would say some of those have direct ties to the Bible. Okay? Yes. I would say some of them do, and, and rightfully so. But when we conflate our rights based on our works, when we conflate our rights based on our knowledge, as that one gentleman did in the Libertarian I, uh, uh, video essay, I, I think we lose something. I think we lose the fact that our rights are not something that we worked for, earned, or deserved. They're something that was bestowed upon us. And what we've seen the culture do is really lose that narrative, haven't we, Mr. I, I think so. I, I think we have. This topic really, to me, is probably one of the most difficult topics to deal with in a cultural sense. Uh, because you've got a lot of non-believers, and then you have believers. And a lot of believers don't even really give this thing much thought. Uh, when Nikki says that there's responsibility... Yes, there is absolutely responsibility. When you look at the the nudity laws, the indec indecent exposure laws um, in the U.S., to me, they sit on a very thin line, an extremely, extremely thin line. And personally, I go back to our Supreme Court for allowing that. That should have never gotten to that point. And it did. The church should have never allowed it to get to that point. It and came, it did. It came from case law. Yes. Being move, moving away from natural and common law, yeah. which were God's laws. And I think that's probably to the detriment of America because what it ultimately got us, it got us the Hugh Hefners and the Larry Flynn's of this world. So let me dive in for a moment on that because there's been a in this bizarre push on the right on the on especially on the um, secular humanist right, which is I know it's a conflation. It's kind of weird, but there is a side of the right that's really focused on traditionalism. Mm -hmm. It's focused on the trad wives, the trad masculinity, the trad this trad lifestyle, going out and and starting a farm. There's this yearning in the culture for something and for a return to a structure because we've lost a lot of rights, Yep. right? The government has rather stolen a lot of that. We've lost a lot of the value, a lot of the safety. But what are they really yearning for in, in the whole trad movement? They want the value. They want the goodness out of some of these issues. They want the good aspects. What they don't want is they want nothing to do with having to acknowledge God being the center of that. The foundation. That, that, the foundation of it. They, they want, because the moment that you do that, now you become accountable to somebody higher than you. And ultimately, as, as humans, that's, that's what we don't want. Yeah. We want our own thing. But, and we're getting to a point where we think 
an individual right can supersede everybody else's right. Uh, transgenderism in a male uh, working in a woman's sports. Okay, that they don't have any rights. I just listened to a podcast with Riley Gaines when uh, the Tom Thompson boy, Le- Leah the, Thompson, yeah, when he went to the locker room, they had no rights. They were told, "You don't have any right to say anything," and they had to go through all this counseling, but they had no rights. He had all the rights. So that's a great example. Of the the um, this is where case law leads, Melissa. I'm just saying uh, we, I we need agree. to go back to Blackstone. Amen. <laughs> Agreed. I totally agree with that. But that there is a is a good example, and I think ultimately, uh, if you want to a- analyze it like this, person A says they have the right to murder person B. Person B says I have the right to live. That's what, we what, are. We're, what it's going to do is it leads to chaos in survival of the fittest. And that's coming. I mean, that's, that is coming. You really it's, can see that but, shaping up. But I want to necessarily like, you know, poo poo on case law. I mean, if case law is done biblically and correctly. So if I say like the Leah Thompson ordeal. So let's say the case law went into favor with biblical law from the start. Well, the next time somebody tries to attempt to do the same deal, they'll see what happened in the Thompson case and be like, no, this was wrong. This was not supported. It will go in the right direction. By definition, Let me, what is case law? Uh, I was going to say. By, by, by definition, just so everyone understands, what is case law? It's the precedent of what happened. What happened before. before. So by, Interpreted so, by who? By, by man. By, by man. But that's, so so but every it, man, every man or woman. Uh, that is, it has an input on it, now has more, as much or more input than God himself. And they all saw also, what was right in their own eyes. That's mm-hmm. it. Which that's means, it. which is important why right. we need to vote in the people that we need to vote in for to make sure that we are putting godly men and women in place. Totally agree. So whenever we do do case law, ah. then... That's, you that's will, his point, though. Because you, it, The because moment you go to case law, it doesn't matter if it's a Christian or not. You've put yourself on a slope that allows man to man's, interpret. Man's input into the morality right. of the law. Case law has value. And don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying, Melissa. Case law certainly has value. But where I, I, I'm, I'm coming out swinging hard against it is we've seen its corruption. And it, it, it's a man-made institution and it, it, or philosophy, right, where you say – I'm going to look at the way it was ruled on by so and so and so and so. I'm not going to look at it in. Com- so let me give you the alternative to case law. May, may I have permission to speak? Do you have the court's permission? <laughs> Proceed. Thank you. Well, Thank in you. Previous case law, it has shown so, that, oh, Steve. that doing that. Um... Okay. So the, the the here's here's my alternative to case law. We look at the Bible. We, we do what was what was very much in vogue with Blackstone's, uh, uh, you know, that whole tradition. It wasn't Blackstone's law, but you know what I mean. Blackstone's law. It's a, it was largely, his teaching, largely quoted out of the Bible. And you go to the Bible, and you say, "Look, here you have a divorce. This divorce is not. It, it's not really in our authority because you went to a different court. You went to a higher court, the church, to get married. It's in the." That ball is literally in the church's court. Go take it over there. You say you want a no-fault divorce. You're going to have to figure out what that means and what and what that is. If the guy's hitting you, let's prosecute him for assault and battery. If he's doing whatever, and, and then and then let's get a divorce through the church because that's absolutely allowed. If you have a man and a woman, right, that is a opportunity for marriage. If you have a man and a man, well— Marriage isn't the government's business, but because we've made it the government's business, they've been allowed to case by case build up a case law study against that, and 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 that's where you have. And I know Obergefell was a, was a terrible decision, but it set precedent. Instead of going to the Bible every single time, 
we're relying on precedents that have been set by corrupt judges. We're lying on, we're relying on the interpretation by man of morality itself. Yep. And but so, if you put the right people, the right judges, the non-corrupt judges in place, uh -huh. then you're going to get you know good case law that is biblically supported because you put godly men and women in these positions. If you don't put and, them in there. Well, if you don't put them in there, you're going to get corrupt people that's going to have corrupt laws. So let, let It goes me back to the, the church and the responsibility. And as, because if the church as a yes. whole saw society and our country and from a biblical worldview, mm -hmm. we would not have this. We would always have corruption. There are always going to be little parts of it somewhere. But it would change the dynamic. So let me yeah. give you two two options, okay? You have you have case law. You either put in good people and good results mostly come out, even though human errors will be introduced. Okay. Or you put in bad people through fraud or, or just apathy from the church or what have you, and then case law is bad and there's no morality. Okay, that's option one. Option two, biblical morality, where you say, look, we have a law book written by someone like Blackstone, where it's like, these are, this is what works with all these different types of cases. And it's based on biblical morality, no case law. I really don't care how another judge adjudicated this judge. You have to go study. You have to go look at what you're, what, what's before you become a biblical and, scholar. Yeah. And you have to be a scholar of morality and yep. don't, don't, I don't really care what another judge says what is the law and what is moral and i don't really care about case law it, so if you don't elect good people in they're going to do exactly what's happening in case law I and think... then and then if you do elect good people in judges don't feel like they have to abide by the lack of morality this is a this is a whole nother podcast that i think we should do <laughs> i would love to do a one-on-one -on -one debate charlie think... can you be our uh I, I, can, I can moderate on that <laughs> I think the the one thing that I would point to for a, an analogy on this might might be this. We all know about the little story of taking a little story from person to person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what happens after about seven or eight, you've got a completely different story. Mm -hmm. I think that's the same thing. Even even Melissa, if you put in quote unquote godly people, after seven or eight, what am I going to end up with? That that is that's the slope. Mm -hmm. That's I, I I for me. Let's, I can't do it. Let's debate this at a later time because I, I we, we got to go to politics because I do actually want to pull this in. Is that all right? Let's, all right. Let's pull this out. We, we got to pull this in. We got to pull this in here. Okay. The big rope. So Steve, once once rights have been taken out of the biblical framework. Okay. You, you with me now? <laughs> we're taking, we're okay. taking rights out of it. Once rights have been taken outside of the biblical framework and transform or transferred to the social contract framework, the, the framework of government, etc. How do consequences and responsibilities to rights change? I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna put these in your head, and then we're gonna watch this video. And then I want you to respond to this when permissions have been given to adults to expose themselves to kids or when the consequences for uh, an adult taking advantage of a child in the most gruesome and horrible way is allowed to happen. Uh, what happens to parents who react justifiably to interactions with perverts to their kids? I'm going to pull up this video and we're going to see a little bit of that. And I want your commentary on that in just a moment, Steve. So. Let's go ahead and watch this. This is a news story out of uh, WDRB News. Link in the description. Minnesota man confesses to murdering another man with a shovel and a moose antler. 27 year old Levi Axtell reportedly says he hit Lawrence Scully on the head about two dozen times with the shovel he found on Scully's deck. Then he says he hit him several more times with a large moose antler to, quote, finish him off. Then Axtell went to the police station to turn himself in. He got down on his knees and he put his hands up behind his, his the back of his head and the deputies uh, went out and escorted him into our booking area. 
Axel told police he believes Scully was stalking his daughter. In 1979, Scully was convicted of sexually assaulting a six-year-old girl, making him a registered sex offender. Axel filed an order of protection against him in 2018, saying he believes Scully would reoffend. Axel is being held on a million-dollar bond. Okay, so a little bit more context behind that. Uh, the gentleman who was uh, beat to death with the shovel and the moose antler, by the way, yeoman's work there. Good job, uh, dad. I am so proud of you. Um, that gentleman had been, I use the term loosely, had been the, the, the essay offender, had actually been driving behind this little girl mm -hmm. on her way home from school every day. And so the dad comes and says, hey, I don't really appreciate you checking out my daughter. I know that you're on the list. And he had he had uh, gotten restraining orders from him. The cops said, we can't do anything about it. And so they dropped the restraining order. And the guy the next day was back driving behind this little girl with his big white van. So dad goes over and says, hey, you need to knock it off. And the other guy, you know, assumably said, F you. And so that's where dad snapped and uh he doesn't have to worry about it anymore steve good for him when we have a society that has taken morality because it used to be a guy like this would be put to death right like it's it, you're not allowed a second chance to do this but we have shifted morality we've gone from from death penalty in cases of clear like clear essay right and and there's no other room to this Jeremy Bentham style of putting them in a prison and kind of keeping them nice yeah. and comfortable for two years and then we yeah. re-release them to the public. Hmm. When we've shifted morality like that, what happens to society and how does the government end up doing evil? Well, you and what happens is is it turns bad for society. And the government ends up getting bad because you have people who are more concerned about the victim or not the victim, but the perpetrator instead of the victim. They make the perpetrator the victim and are more concerned about what's going on with them. Let's say like uh, some of these perverts, they'll get six months probation. I mean, it's gotten to the point where um, these guys will essay some, some a child mm -hmm. and give them six months probation. And so how absurd is that, John Arthur? And that's when I said the social contract is in play. You just watched a video detailing the social contract playing out. Okay, I'm going to have to. Right. I have to interject. You're exactly I got to right. I got to interject here. First off. Hold on. Yeah. First off, okay? As a Christian, if this was going on with our our child, um there would be no opportunity to follow her home from school because somebody would be picking her up. That's number 1. Number 2, uh and I'm talking from a Christian who has been on her face praying over the protection of her children. And God has always made a way. So if this were Charlie and I, we would take action to remove our child out of the, the sight of this person. If we did not have that means, then we would have a campaign going about this person is been arrested. This per I mean, he did. He and, did. And if there, if that came, I mean, I'm telling you, God would provide us a way. This guy was was peering in through the recess. This guy complained. So so the the. Well, that's a school the issue pedo, there. The, the pedo was was peeking over the fence. Uh, the dad told the school about it. He brought it up to the community. He called the cops, and the cops said, "Can't help you." And yeah, he's following your little daughter, but we can't do anything about it. We'll have to remove the restraining order because he hasn't done anything in two weeks, even though he was following her for months. You got a guy that's a pervert. He's registered. He's processing what is going on and is following through and setting up. Not only that, he is driving a white panel <laughs> fan. 
He's like, the whole thing. I mean, it is the whole setup on what it is that people imagine exactly what a pervert's going to snatch has a kid been, and has do. He, has he been tried yet? Because Yes. No, and yes. What, no, no, no. He was released. Th this is after he was convicted. And uh, uh, what did he get? I mean, because what he did got the like jury... a year or two? Because the jury would take all that into consideration too. He got like a year or two. So what? 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 What I'm saying is, is a, Daddy, I, I appreciate your your candor, but maybe you can just hide the body. Um, right. But uh, the jury probably went easier on him for that. But what we see is we see a breakdown of that social fabric because we have changed at the theological level. We've decided that look. We can, we can use the prison system to rehabilitate people. God said there's three ways to punish someone. You don't take away their, their freedom to walk around. You put them down like an animal if they're that bad. You make them pay for the rest of their life for their crime. This sort of crime, n no payment will fix. No. And then, of course, you, you can publicly cane them uh, or whip them 39 times. That was the, that, that was the standard for that and what we've done instead is we said look well we can put them in prison and rehabilitate them studies have shown that prison does not rehabilitate no. it only hardens nope. yeah it only hardens and look if, if if you're gonna steal please please steal my twenty thousand dollar car i would love 5x return on that uh to be paid to me over the next 10 years after my car is returned uh you know that's a great way to run your legal system uh, so please steal my car if I'm going to be if it's going to be restored to me, and your your garnish your wages are going to be garnished until that time, right? So that's a much cleaner system. But instead, what we have is we have this six month probation or two years in jail. I think is what the guy had. Don't don't quote me. It was a very short time, and he was back on the streets, literally yeah. brazenly doing it, looking into kids' playground yards and. I asked about the Just, the father that did the killing. What was his sentence? Oh, oh, that's what you were. That's saying. what I was asking about. And you said, oh, one or two years. And no, I'm thinking, no, no, okay. no, 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 no. I'd have to look that up specifically. It sh shouldn't have been anything. I, I some 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 people have been let off the hook entirely. Uh, I, I'm I'm have to look that up. So moose been given an award. Or Antler, something. dad. So go ahead. Yeah, and. and I think to Steve's point that he brought up earlier, where ultimate leads is right being wrong, wrong being right, and we've got our uh, our society backwards on what we should be doing. I I think those points you made were we've were good there. So he's we've still in jail. We've sacrificed children. Yeah, he's still yeah, in jail. That's what we have. He's still in jail. He's still in jail. And this was when? This was in uh, twenty March twenty twenty three. He's still in jail. Um, I'm looking for, yeah, I think he's still in jail. So he's going to be there for a while. Uh, I, I can't find a clear sense of things. So it's a, yeah. it's a difficult spot for him. I mean, you do something like that. Now you're taking yourself out of the place of being able to be a dad, be a dad. So it, I would, this, this ain't I, I good. Would, I would take the trade if I had to, if it was, if it was between my daughter's innocence and my liberty. But I would really try to find a better way. Yeah, I would really try to find a better way. I, I but he should have like buried the guy better. <laughs> it's basically. So here, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this out to the group here, and I want to get y'all's thoughts in just a moment. So what what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play this video, okay? And this video is from the Megan Kelly show, and she's interviewing uh, a fella by the name of Jack. And if you remember, hi Jack. Who is Jack? What 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 did he make? It was cake time. It was cakes. And Jack made cakes. And unfortunately, he's no longer making cakes. What happens to your you life when morality when morality is um, basically left up to the government? It's left up to individuals to decide it based on game theory. Let's let's check this you, out. You decide not to let anybody tell you what to do. Jack, how did you feel compelled to, to participate in their wedding just by baking the cake? You weren't forced to go like the photographers in those cases we see. You weren't forced to actually be at the wedding or endorse the wedding. Yeah. 
When they come into my shop, they're asking for a custom piece of artwork. So I take my time, my talent, my energy, we sit down, we make sketches, we go through everything to make the cake, ideally, um, for them. But it's, then it becomes a work of art, the cake becomes a canvas where I actually paint on cakes. I do all, a lot of expressive. Um, mm -hmm. You feel like that's too participatory in the, in the process? Yeah, whether I'm there or not, the cake is actually um, um, an artistic creation. Let me and ask you, when you, see those, when you see those two young men talking about how it brought tears to their eyes and how they felt like second class citizens, how did that make you feel? Yeah. Um, I apologize to the young man. I, I told him I'd sell them anything else in my shop, even offer to make other creative cakes. But it's been emotional for us as well. There were days where my wife was afraid. Actually, afraid to come to the shop. We've had death threats, harassing phone calls. I've been forced by the government to give up 40% of my business, half of my employees. Um, it's hmm. been emotional on our side as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the Supreme Court, in, in passing that landmark ruling in 2015, specifically made allowances for the fact that there would be clashes of this type. They recognized that that ruling would lead to some clashes, and we're still struggling to resolve it, aren't we? Yes, but we're optimistic. I mean, I think Justice Kennedy's remarks were important at the hearing this last week. He said that essentially tolerance is the mark of a free society, and Colorado has not been tolerant towards Jack. He was talking about Justice Kennedy seems on the fence about it. He's the one who authored the gay marriage ruling. He seems on the fence because the, the court did not seem to mean to, to throw out all Christian beliefs and the, the ability to exercise them in, in reaching that conclusion. But on the, other, on the other side, you can understand they have the legal right and in their view. Okay. I want to pause here and we'll continue in a moment. They have the legal right. No, they don't. What is a right? Thank you. And that's why I defined it very specifically. Your rights only come, I believe, under the moral authority of God because they're an outgrowth of you being an image bearer of God. Whatever is right, just, true, and it is, it, it is something that is given to you by God, that is your right. It is deeded to you. Being able to buy from an artist a piece of artwork that expresses sexual deviancy is not a right. Amen. That's, that's why in this man has the right to freedom of association. You don't, I don't, you don't have, you don't have the obligation for me to come and buy something from you. If you don't want to sell your car today. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, Charlie, uh, I'm, I've got five bucks in my pocket. I want to buy your Dodge Ram. What is it, 2014? Yep. Okay. I want to buy this this, this nice-looking blue pickup from you, $5. Here. You don't have the obligation, and neither do I have the right to ask that. You have the right to your property. Excuse me. I have a right to buy it for $3. <laughs> yeah. All I can say is gay. Oh, but, but that's what they're doing, isn't it? They're adding their rights they're rewriting yes what god bestowed through his image melissa yep am i muted now no yeah, you weren't muted in the first place <laughs> 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 but it's it's the irony is so it's almost comical because you have this guy that's obviously you know he didn't want to do a cake which was against what his moral obligations to god was and so but let's say you do you on the flip side let's say I was, i'm a christian i wanted a christian cake and i went to a and there's those dirty cake shops that do dirty cakes dirty cakes yeah and so but if i was if i was a christian i was like hey i want you to do a a, a christian clean cake cake they could easily tell me no I'm not going to do this. It's not in our spectrum of what we do. Yeah. And nobody would bat an eye. That's but, well, they wouldn't. No. And they, I mean, you're talking about this, but do you remember when Sarah Sanders went to a restaurant? She was told to leave because she was a Republican. Do you remember that a few years ago? That's yeah. not, but so it, that, that's a, in itself. That was the owner. 
the owner told her, we're not serving you. But it's a it's a private business. But I can I can deny somebody anybody that I want to the, yes. the right to be in my establishment. But your question is really interesting and in, in it wouldn't you love to have a Christian actually do that? Because what the Supreme Court said is, yes, Christian, you can walk in there and tell them to do that and they must do it. That's what the Supreme Court ruled. I thought now, that, didn't he what, win that, that? Yeah, eventually, eventually he, he did. He, he, he won, won, but after the loss of countless amounts of time and treasure, a, a quarter of his life, how long has that case been going on? Well, you and know, I say Supreme Court, that was a Colorado Supreme Court. This is, this is where we have to listen. We're Americans and we live in comfort and we have a lot and we just brag about all of our freedoms. But we have to go back in time and, or go across seas and look at our brothers and sisters in Christ. They have to make sacrifices to stand for the Lord. And sometimes, you know, uh, the disciples, with the exception of John, had to cost them their life. And many Christians throughout the ages cost them their lives, cost them their businesses, cost them their freedom to stand for Christ. So I, I, I feel bad. I, I feel bad. But we have to come to a realization that just because you're in America, things have changed. Are you going to stand for the Lord mm -hmm. no matter what the consequences are? And by the way, John, actually, I, I would argue that dying in exile under under guard is effectively giving your life. I will. I, 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 I'll agree. Dying I'll agree. Prison. And I think this man had a right to say, no, I think what I would have done is say, there's there's this guy down the street that you know. Well, he did that. Oh, no, that that wasn't the purpose. But he did that. But they yeah. they were they were only interested in coming after him. He offered yeah. This is a girl. lawfare case. This is one of the earliest lawfare, lawfare cases that you could possibly find. That's it. In the modern day, that was one of the early ones. So all of that to say, just bringing it back to the topic of rights. This is the in out. This is the the end result. The outgrowth of taking God's. Um, God's law, making case law, taking things that are, when you allow man to slowly corrupt your, your morality and your law system, your legal system, you're going to end up with a situation where man has decided through multiple iterations and perversions of God's law that, hey, this wrong is now right, right is now wrong. In those days, you know, woe to those who say good is evil and evil is good. We're living in those days right now. Yeah. We're living in that right now. And we're seeing it flipped on its head because instead of focusing on God's word, instead of focusing on on uh, the biblical concepts, instead of gazing into the eyes of our creator, we've started to look to ourselves. We've looked at what other, other uh, uh, legal scholars have done. And that's fine, well, and good. I am all for looking at how other cases were decided. I think that that's really interesting. Doesn't matter if you have a case before you, if you have this case, this guy has a right mm -hmm. to his business. He has a right to freedom of association. He has a right to his own artistic expression. And that does not belong to some rando. And if you continue on, by the way, link in the description below, as always, Megan Kelly goes and makes the argument, well, you make cakes, just make the cake. And, and the guy goes, I, I, I don't, I don't have to make you a cake. Mm -hmm. And she, and she, and the lawyer pushes back and says, this is going to be a problem for journalists like you, because you, if you don't say certain things, they, they could come after you. And she goes, well, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a news reporter for hire. I, I, I speak it doesn't matter. She, she lost that job, by and the way. She lost that job. <laughs> she lost I know. that job because of what she said. <laughs> I know, which is great. I feel like that was like there's a little bit of sweet justice. Uh, Megan Kelly's fine and everything. I, I think Megan has probably come around to some things that she thought one day was okay, and today not so much. It sucks to be on the receiving end of the stick. Yep, doesn't it? Yep. So with that said, you, on the on the value side, you lose your ability to work, your ability to feed your family. That man had to stop making cakes entirely. Watch the rest of it and you'll see that he he stopped making cakes entirely for custom cakes. He made things he just put out there. His dreams, his job, the thing that he loved to do, 
all gone. And it's because we decided to put morality on a sliding scale yeah. and our rights on a sliding scale. If rights don't come from God, if they don't come from the essence of us being image bearers, the authority of God, the, the, the righteousness of God dictates what our rights are and are not. Once we divorce from that, there is no going yep. back. It's all a free fall. Yep. So final thoughts going around the room. Miss Nikki. Well, I just think that you need to understand that God has given us certain rights. You need to understand what the biblical principles are that. You need to understand that they hold you're responsible. You have responsibility, but you have purpose. So when you're examining what you think is your right, Go back to what God's purpose is over your life, because you do have purpose. Mm. Melissa. And we need, besides identifying what our God-given rights are, we need to protect those God-given rights and not let the liberal colleagues take it away from us th through whatever means they have. We, we have that obligation to make sure that we keep what God has given us. Amen. Mr. Charlie. It's a difficult topic. And if we don't have the right perspective on it, we will lose it. And I would dare say that's really what we're on the edge of right now. 100%. Mr. Steve. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, I know all of us that sit here, the, uh, floating heads of further every day uh, uh, believe that, you know, all of our rights are given to us by God. And with those rights being given to us from God, that's a large responsibility. Mm -hmm. And with large responsibilities come grave consequences. And there are times that you will suffer grave consequences for making rash or wrong responsibilities, sometimes for even making the right responsibility, mm. mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, especially those of us that are Christian, uh, it's happened to me before, um, make the right decisions and, and you suffer because of it, but that's just part of being a Christian. And we need to learn to stand up for other Christians, even though they make those types of stances for their rights, and we need to learn to continue to do that as Christian brothers and sisters. Mm. Amen. So final thoughts from the chair of economics here. Your freedoms come with responsibilities. It's, you know, Miss Nikki said it one time, she, she talked about authority. And that authority, you have authority in certain places, like a police officer has authority because that's been given to them by the people and often by the police chief who was elected, right? Or appointed by the government that was elected by the people. You have rights, just like some people have authority. Your rights are bestowed to you within a certain silo of activity. You step outside of that and, and you're no longer within your rights. What I mean by that is if you are violating God's moral law, that should be a hint that what you're doing, not only is it not right, it's not within your right to do. Your rights are direct outgrowth of the value that God has placed in you as his image bearer. That is something that is inalienable. That is something that must be protected. And as long as you have freedom here in America, that's something that should be fought for. Your rights are only recognized in one period of time. And it's the modern time. Rights, human rights were not recognized in most of the world for most of history. Sure. You can sit on your laurels, you can sit on your keister, and you can enjoy your, your football, your housewives, whatever it is you watch while your rights go away. If you value your posterity, your legacy, your children, now's the time 
to fight for godliness. And in fighting for godliness, you will be fighting for your rights, true and proper. If you enjoyed this podcast, like, comment, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Thank you so much for over, it's hundreds of thousands of uh, downloads on the podcast itself, over 700 subscribers on YouTube. We are out of YouTube jail. Thank you for hanging out over the break. <laughs> we got uh, a lawyer. We got a lawyer. <laughs> she bailed us out. Melissa is our, is our, is our, well, actually, you know, I actually might ask you to write some briefs. I mean, depending upon what else they do, they have been deleting views again. So we'll just see what, what happens know? with that. But uh, <laughs> Rumble, if you are on YouTube right now, go over to Rumble. The water's warm over there. And uh, frankly, they don't hate you. At least they have nothing against you if you're a conservative. Now, if you did not like this podcast, we understand that and we appreciate your opinion. Let us know by striking that dislike button twice. Okay, it's more effective that way. Uh, and leave an angry comment. It helps with the algorithm. And uh, just, just know the more obscenities and homophobic slurs you put into that comment, the more likely it is that YouTube is actually going to uh, not let us see it. And we'll just see this little blip. So all those nasty little things you say in your comments – I'm the only one that can no see them no. when I'm in the dashboard because you have gotten yourself banned. I don't delete comments, okay? Just so you know. Uh, with that said, comment section is busting down there. Thank you, guys. Tune in next week. We love you so much. You have a wonderful week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Okay, if you're still here, one last thing. Uh, what is the right? What is the right that you that you hold most dear? Uh, freedom of religion. Right to vote. I'm with Nikki. First Amendment right, followed by the Second Amendment right. And I'll tell you what, First Amendment. Followed by the Third Amendment right. <laughs> well, not, so, not really because the Second Amendment backs the, first. backs the First Amendment, which supports and protects all of those rights that we're granted by God. And First Amendment is pretty important. Yes. I'm, I'm going to go a little bit wider than you and Miss Nikki, uh, because it, that's a layup. I'd say freedom of conscience. So that that goes further than just religion. It it's it's I have the right to decide what God and I have worked it out on. I've read His Word. I know what's right, what's not right. I know His will for for my life as best as is possible, and I'm going to follow that. And I have the right to do that. I appreciate that right deeply. Tell us in the comment section below your favorite right. And with that said, we truly have nothing left for you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> we have nothing left for you.